Amen. Well, appreciate everybody here. Appreciate everybody visiting with us online. Let's take our Bibles. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. We'll go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And then we'll say what God tells us to say. 1 Peter chapter 3. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, been praying about what to preach in Kenya. We're going to be, let's see, one, two, three, four different places we're going to preach in just about five or six days. Um, we're going to get there Friday night. Sunday morning, we will get up and take a helicopter to Samburu and preach at the Anglican Church there in Samburu. And I like this. Anglican churches in England, it's Church of England, they're fairly liberal. In Kenya, they're not. And you still find people that believe the Bible. And when I went to Samburu a few years ago, uh, I preached at this church and other churches came and attended. And this pastor actually asked for me to come back, which I, I, was, very, I was very appreciative of. And so we're going to be out there Sunday morning and uh, then we'll be uh, meeting with some pastors, I think, at the radio station uh, that afternoon and then get back. We already know the helicopter pilot likes to get back way before dark. He got mad the first time we went out there, and it was more the governor's fault than anything. But he was really ticked off because it's an hour flight from Samburu back to Nairobi. And the area that we're crossing is uninhabited for the most part. It is lions and leopards and cheetahs and elephants and giraffes and wildebeests and hyenas and gangs with machine guns. So he said, if anything happens to this helicopter and we have to land, I want to land with plenty of daylight so they can find us. And I went, I'm not in Kansas anymore, am I? So, um, so we already, we've already got that issue worked out. Then Monday we'll be preaching in uh, Nairobi with uh, Brother Mike Hutzel, Jason Hutzel. This will be uh, Michael's uncle, Pastor Omondi, uh, who pastors a church there. Some other churches will be in attendance. And we will be uh, sort of church training church teaching and evangelism. And then Tuesday, we will take a regular prop airplane out to Turkana, which is a desert. If you get a chance, go to Google Earth or Google Maps or whatever and look at Turkana versus the rest of Kenya. Okay? The rest of Kenya is real nice and green and a lot of, they grow in the northern areas, they grow a lot of tea and this and that and the other. And Turkana is a desert and it's very hot up there, Michael says. So we'll be up there Tuesday and we'll be at the radio station. I'll be doing Pastor Mike online. I want everybody at Bethel up at four o'clock in the morning. Okay. I will be too, but it'll be noon for me. So, and then uh, coming back to Nairobi that night. Wednesday is the day off. Thursday, we're preaching out at Kilimambogo again, which is where we were uh, with Brother Mike Hutzel a few years ago. I'm looking forward to that meeting. It was great meetings we had out there. Good people. They love the Lord. It's a pretty area of Kenya. And um, the name, it's, it's named after a big sort of a mountain that's next to it. It's kind of like Buck Knob out here in size. 
Buck Knob is this big hill over here at Crystal City that overlooks Mississippi River. And um, Kilimam Kilimambogo is two words. It means hill of the buffalo or Buffalo Hill. That's what it would be. And I asked somebody, I said, is there any buffaloes up there? And he said, I don't know. I've never been up there. So, okay. So anyway, that's where we'll be there Thursday during the day, and then that night at midnight we'll get on a plane and start heading back home. Be home Friday night sometime, and uh, we'll be here then um, Sunday. Brother Randy Casey is going to be here this Sunday, and um, John, you're teaching Sunday school, by the way, in case I forget to tell you later. All right. You got it? Okay. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Are you there? Say amen. amen. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Amen. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. You know, take that idea right there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then I'm going to say something about that real quick. And then we'll move on. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this good word tonight. I thank you, dear God, for these that have come, these that are joining with us online. I pray, Lord, that you'd bless them, bless them and strengthen them through your word. Help them, Lord, in the areas of life that they are in, the situations, Father, that they find themselves in. And Father, if there's someone, Lord, who has, who has need of help, Lord, somebody who has questions, somebody who is hurting, struggling, fighting off the flesh, fighting off devils and principalities, uh, just fighting themselves, Father, you would bless them, you would aid them, you would come to their rescue and help, because Jesus, the mighty Savior is far above principalities and powers, and they are subject to him. They have to do what Jesus tells them to do. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for that victory given to us in the Scripture. Father, I do not understand people who make it sound like that you are helpless against the devil until we say so. Father, sometimes we can't say so. Sometimes we don't know so. But you're there to help us no matter what. And we thank you for that. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the written word of God tonight. Fill our hearts and our minds with it. Send us home, Lord, just praising you and thanking you, Lord, for writing this book and giving it to us. Show us great and mighty things tonight. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said... Amen. There where it says, who has gone into heaven is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. I always think of Ephesians 6, where it says, and you can turn there, for we wrestle not, verse 12, against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers. That's what he mentions here. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. And here we are wrestling against principalities, which is authorities, against powers, uh, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I've been studying uh, pyramids and the Ma Cahokia Mounds. Anybody ever seen Cahokia Mounds? I've never been over there. I got to go see that. You know what that is? Huh? Field trip. There you go. You know what that is? Oh, I was going to say something biblical instead of what you guys were coming up. No, I'm just kidding. It, to, to me, it's a high place. That part of the, the world is flat because it's in, the, it's in the river basin. And because there are no stones there, they drug dirt from over a mile away. The base of that large mound there at Cahokia Mounds is actually one acre larger than the base of the Great Pyramid in Egypt. 
So this was a massive undertaking that these people did. And you see, whether it's, whether it's like these pyramid, step pyramid type mounds, or these round mounds or whatever, or the pyramids in Central America, South America, the pyramids in Egypt, there are pyramids in China, there are, there is an underground pyramid, there is, not, un, not underground, an underwater pyramid off the coast of Japan. Divers found it a few years ago. You can, you can see it on the internet. Clearly an underwater pyramid, obviously there at one point when the earth was dry and then got buried by water. Get what I'm saying? Okay. What I think those are, are the high places. In the Old Testament, they worshipped in the high places. Solomon was part of this. He helped build some of the high places. Some of the other kings helped build the high places. God told them, don't do that. Don't learn the religion of the Canaanites. And that's what they did. And they built the high places. They built these mounds or these pyramids or these towers or whatever it was. And that elevated them. And that's, see, what they were doing is they were meeting the gods, I think. Kind of getting up higher and they would do their sacrifices there and there where it says spiritual wickedness in high places i think that's part of it and uh so there is two universal religions in this world there is bible christianity or bible believing and then there is the high places witchcraft and so on and uh practically every religion has this same concept but the idea is, is that we are wrestling against these things. We, our fight is not with flesh and blood. It's not with other people. It's not with one another. Certainly it's not with one another. But we are fighting devils. And these devils, according to 1 Peter 3, doesn't matter what Benny Hinn says, doesn't matter what Joyce Meyer says or Kenneth Copeland says, these devils are subject to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is above them. He is higher than them. They have to do, when Jesus encountered somebody with devils, when Jesus told those devils to shut up and leave, they shut up and left. They didn't have, and they were afraid of Jesus because they knew what power he had. He had power to cast them into the bottomless pit. They did not want to be there. So he had authority over them and he still does. When you can't win the fight, you've got one who can. Amen. Thank you for that, John. Now, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. What is he doing at that right hand of the Father? Uh, let's see here. Let's go. Let's start here. Galatians 3. Turn there. Galatians 3. What Jesus is doing for us right this very minute. He is in the position of the mediator, he is in the position of, the book of Job says, uses the word days man, he, because he said, is there a days man between us? There is a negotiator, a mediator, a go-between, a middleman. Christ is serving that position because... Two things in this world are impossible to do. Number one, it is impossible for you to speak directly to God the Father. It is impossible. The reason being, give me a reason why it's impossible for you to talk directly to God. Yes, ma'am. Yes, that's what I'm teaching. Why is it impossible for us to talk to God the Father? Why can't we do it? We're unclean. We are full of sin. We're undone. We are unclean. We have no right to approach God the Father by ourselves, in and of ourselves. We'll, it'll kill us dead. The second thing that's impossible to happen, it is impossible for God the Father to speak directly to us. It is impossible. And we're going to look at that here in a little bit. Uh, if you did not see 
Pastor Mike online yesterday. I want to strongly encourage you to. I was made aware of this by way of our Facebook group. Somebody caught on to this. There is a, a Christian bookstore down in Dalton, Georgia that miracles are taking place right now. A man had a Bible and all of a sudden that Bible started producing anointing oil right out of the Bible. He thought his grandchild had spilled their drink on it or something like that. Come to find out it was oil coming, I mean literally oil coming out of this Bible. So he sets it in this big tub, leaves it overnight, and lo and behold, the next day, there would be an inch or two of oil in that tub. Now, I want you to get this. This is at a bookstore. What happens at book stores? What do they do at book stores? Sell books. This place is full of customers every day now. Coming in and out, nonstop, to see the miracle NIV Bible. <laughs> producing oil. Do you hear what my stupid, uh, my beautiful sister said? She, I said, it's producing oil. She said, that's slick. That's the Corzine side of the family coming out of her right there. So anyway, when questioned about this miracle oil, the owner of the bookstore says, well, we asked God that question. And God gave us three, God told us three things. God said this, and God said that, and God said this, and that, and the other. And I said, you're a liar. Man's a liar. How do I know that? I got a book full of the truth. If there was ever a way that God was going to spew oil out of the scriptures, it would be in the scriptures. But it's not. It's not. So this man, watch this now, this man is saying that God is talking directly to him giving him these revelations as to why oil is coming out of this Bible. Now, you want to know what I think? I think that somebody is going in there at night and dumping mineral oil in this tub. So for $10 worth of mineral oil, this bookstore is raking it in every day. The love of money is still the root of all evil. And there are now and will continue to be lying signs and wonders. How is it that God's people can actually know the difference between what is true and what is a lie? We have the mediator, Christ, who said that he would tell us everything that God has to say to us. Jesus would tell us what that was. And he did. Right here in this book. Now, Galatians 3.19. So, here's the first part of this, and I started on this last Wednesday night. The first part of this is, you and I cannot talk directly to God the Father. We must go through the office of Jesus Christ as the meteor, mediator. Galatians 3.19. Wherefore then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels... In the hand of a mediator. Now, pay attention to that phrase. Do you have your Bible open? Underline that. In the hand of a mediator. Somebody explain to me. JR, how you doing? Explain to these great people here how... Somebody could put words in their hand. Would you go, everybody listen to what I'm saying, and then go. Would that work? 
How would somebody put words in their hand? Write it. Very good. Very good. I knew he would come up with the answer. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he did not come down empty-handed. He came down holding two tables of stone written with the finger of God. He did not come down empty-handed. He brought the covenant down from God. Here's the covenant. Here's the Ten Commandments. Do these and you can live in the land. It was a written contract delivered by the mediator, Moses. God did not come down from Mount Sinai. He sent Moses, the mediator, between Israel and God himself. He sent Moses, but he did not send him empty-handed. He sent him with a copy of his law in writing to the Israelites. And Moses came down then and read everything that God told him up there. He read it just in case they didn't believe what he said. He had it in writing. Amen? Who in here would trust buying a used car from somebody with a handshake? I'll put it to you like this. Who in here would trust if you were selling a car to somebody and they came and said, I have all the money for this car at home. Let me have the keys and the title and I'll drive home and get it for you. Would you do that, Sterling? No, I know you. Get it in writing. So therefore, Christ... In Revelation chapter 5, God has the book in his right hand, sealed with seven seals. Jesus then takes the book and he looses the seals. And so when we see him, I believe in Revelation 10, he's standing there not empty handed. He has the little book open in his hand and he is then the mediator of the new covenant, not the old covenant. Uh, First Timothy. Chapter 2, turn there, it's 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, I want you to especially pray for me as you are turning the pages of your Bible because I am seriously considering when I go to Turkana, I just, I don't know, I got this in me. Since I already know that two groups of people have come to our radio station in Turkana and complained the first group being the Seventh-day Adventists. They didn't like the guy that they heard on the radio. So they're, they didn't like the guy on the radio. So they're, they're um, what am I trying to say here? Their remedy for that is to get that guy off the radio. Now, if you don't like the guy that you're hearing on the radio, what do you do? Change the channel. They didn't want that. They didn't want me saying what I was saying about their religion because they were afraid that their people would hear it and then not be in their religion anymore. Well, that's what I want. Then the Roman Catholic priest came down and said, get this guy off the radio station. Well, if you don't like it, change the channel. That's not what they wanted. They wanted, they do not want their people to listen to me tell them that they could actually be free and that their priest is not their mediator. So, when I go to Turkana, give me two things that I think I should talk about down there. Hour number one, Seventh-day Adventist Church. Hour number two, the Roman Catholic Church. And I'm dead serious about it. First Timothy chapter two, and this has everything to do. If you talk to somebody, who in here knows somebody that is Roman Catholic and you care about them? First Timothy chapter 2, underline this in your Bible. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks. There's four things here, by the way. Giving of thanks be made for all men. 
for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. It is not the man, the priest. It is not the woman, Ellen White. It is not Mary. It is not St. Jude. It is not St. Joseph. It is not St. Uh, Pope Paul II. It's not any of these clowns. It is one mediator between us and God, Jesus Christ and Him alone. You underline that. And when you are talking to your... Tim Barron's right now is down in Mexico. He's down there. He's got 3,000 chick tracks called Mary. Why is Mary crying? And he's targeting specifically Roman Catholics that live in Mexico City. You pray for him while he's down there. Lift him up. I think he's leaving tomorrow too to go to Mexico. And we're leaving tomorrow to go to Kenya. So you pray for him because he's going to be trying to... I, I prayed that out of 3,000 tracks, God would save one Roman Catholic. That's not too hard for God, is it? But what these people have been told is that Mary is the mediator, that St. Joseph is the mediator, that this saint on this day is the mediator, and on this day, it's another saint that's the mediator, and on November 1st, it's all the saints are mediators between you and Jesus Christ. Jesus goes to God. They're putting other people in the place of Jesus Christ, and Christ will not have it. Amen. He will not have it. You underline that in your Bible and know how to at least quote it if you can't show it to other people. You have people that are Roman Catholics like some of you were. God brought you out. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you glad that God saved you from that godless system? Well, they're going to the same hell you were headed for. They deserve a chance. Amen. Turn to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Come on, get them Bibles. Get that Bible warmed up. The pages of your Bible is going to fuel the jet plane I ride on tomorrow, so get them open. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. The Bible says, But now he hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of what kind of covenant? Better covenant, not the Mount Sinai covenant. This is the new covenant which was established upon better promises. For the first covenant, talking about Mount Sinai, if the Ten Commandments, that covenant, if that had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Now I want you to think about what he's saying here. You were born, if you're saved, you were born twice. Why would you want to be born twice? Your first birth wasn't very good. Your first life wasn't good. And you know it. So, the people who are enjoying life right now, do they need to get saved in their eyes? Not in their eyes. If they're living their best life now, why would they want another one? They're living it up. If a guy's, if a guy's got women, he's got alcohol, he's got drugs, he's got power, he's got money, get, buys his way out of everything or fights his way out of everything or whatever, and he lives this good life here on this earth, what is there for him that he would search out a second life? There isn't one. By the way, there's a website called Second Life. Do you know what it is? Don't do it. Don't go there. It is a virtual reality social media group where you can go and cre recreate yourself. 
You can make yourself in this computer-generated world any way that you want. If you're five foot two and you want to be six foot eight, you can be six foot eight in this other virtual computer-based world. Now that may seem silly to some people, but I'm telling you, the people who go here, they live inside that other world. And now with the virtual reality, it brings it one step closer to reality for these people. Because there are, there are sodomites there who don't like their gender. When they go into the second life world, they are whatever gender they want to be and get away with it. Yeah. Ugly people can become beautiful. Poor people can become rich. You can be a ruler of your own kingdom. You can do whatever you want. There's a movie out called Ready Player One by Steven Spielberg. Just came out here not too long ago. And it's about this virtual reality world. It is based on the future, but it is where everything is headed right now. Sterling, you'll never get into this. I don't see you sitting there with a pair of these virtual reality glasses and you pretending to be something that you're not. I don't see Sterling doing that. But I see Liam and Mason and Audrey. The technology, what's the technology going to be like for them when they get 15, 16, 18 years old? It's going to be nuts. But you see what it is. They're not happy with this life. So they go into their second life. And what it is, it's a replacement for being born again. Amen. I wasn't happy with my first life. So I asked God to give me another one, and it's better than the first one. So do you understand that now? That's why. If the Old Testament would have been sufficient, why did Jesus come and give us a new covenant? Because he promised that he would in Jeremiah 31. So... Uh, let's see here. Verse, uh, let's go to verse nine. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. He's quoting from Jeremiah 31, uh, saith the Lord. Um, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. Notice that, notice the transition. Right now, the law in his word we have to carry it around in a Bible. And we don't remember all of it all at once, do we? But there's coming a time when we, when we get changed, we're going to know every word of the Bible. Because, and we're not going to have to carry King James Bibles and iPads and phones around. God's going to write it inside. He's going to take it from here and put it here. Amen? Amen? Okay, so that's better than the way... You talk about being able to search the Bible, that's the way to do it. Okay? So, he said, I'll put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. He's talking about the old covenant and he's talking about us. We're not getting better as we get older. We like to say that, like cheese and wine gets better as it gets older. No, we're not. Now turn to Hebrews 9. Come on. Flap that page. Put some fuel in the jet so I can get to Kenya. I'd hate for them to run out of gas over Ethiopia. Hebrews 9, 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh... How much more, notice the contrast, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for here it is, verse 15, underline this, for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament. Jesus was not the mediator of the Old Covenant, was he? Moses was. What happened to Moses? He died. 
Where's the tables that God wrote the Ten Commandments on? Where are they right now? What museum are they in? We don't, nobody knows where they are. They're gone. Where's even the Ark of the Covenant? It's in Area 51 in a warehouse. Didn't you see the movie? Okay. Those are gone. They're gone. Just like our old body is going to be gone. This cause he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal in. Inheritance. You see, Moses' covenant that he mediated between Israel and God was not for an everlasting inheritance. It was not for heaven. Let me say it that way. The covenant and the, and the promise that God made to Israel was for the patch of land that sits in the Middle Eastern area. Between the Mediterranean Sea and the Tigris River. It was only for that land. That's going to vanish away. Jesus then, the mediator of the New Testament, doesn't promise us an earthly inheritance. He promises us a heavenly inheritance. One that's never, ever, ever going to fade away. New car smell will never leave heaven. Amen. Amen. You won't have to keep spraying it all the time. Amen. So turn to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Man, I love Hebrews. Especially when it's Hebrews coffee. Some of you will wake up tomorrow and, think, and know that what that means then. Hebrews 12, 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. He's talking about Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated. The, by the way, let me, let me t let's deal with this for a minute. It was a trumpet that summoned the Israelites to Mount Sinai so they could get their covenant. It's going to be a trumpet, Philip, that summons us to Mount Zion in heaven for the fulfillment of the covenant that God has made with us. Amen. For they could not endure that which is commanded, verse 20, and if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it should be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Even the mediator got scared. Now, verse 22, but ye are come unto Mount Sion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Not, not the old covenant, and especially not the fourth commandment. What's the fourth commandment? Huh? Remember the Sabbath day. Ellen White said that an angel took her to heaven and showed her that Christ nailed nine commandments to the cross, but the fourth commandment we still have to keep in order to go to heaven. So Ellen White's whole religion is about the old covenant saving us, not the new. And it's a false gospel. It's false. Amen. Thank you, John. Jesus, mediator of the new covenant. Verse 25. Here's the, here's your, here's your instructions. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. Hold your place there in Hebrews and turn to Exodus 20. Exodus 20. 
This is where this is where we're going to we're going to stop here. And now we're going to transition to the, the other part of the mediator of Christ. Christ stands between us and God so that when we pray, God can hear us. Because Jesus bears our petitions to his Father. The Holy Spirit speaks things that cannot be uttered by us. We don't know what to ask or think to begin with. So Jesus aids us, the Holy Spirit aids us to be the intermediary between us and God so that when we pray, God will hear it. So, I'm just old-fashioned this way, but I think if you're going to pray, then you pray and you finish it all up saying, In Jesus' name I pray. Because if you don't do that, who did you pray to? Yes, ma'am. I'm praying it. The not, you have a knowledge. Okay? And God knows this. God is not saying, now, if you don't say this exactly right, I'm not going to hear it. Okay? He knows that you know that he knows he, he's listening. Right? You know that you can, you are praying to God the Father. Therefore, let us come boldly before the throne of grace. See, that's God sitting on the mercy seat. What enables us to go to God on his mercy seat and us go boldly without fear is that we know that Jesus is bearing that prayer to his Father. It's going through him to God. Does that make sense? We know that. God knows we know it. We know that God knows we know that he knows it. Chase that down, okay? So, but I, I think that to assume that you can talk to God and leave Christ out. And I'm going to throw you a curveball here. Yeah. Yeah. I am not, I am against restoring mandatory school prayers. I'm against it now. Why would I be against it? They would never, they would never allow Jesus' name to be used. Never. See, devils know this. Devils know it. They know that if we can cut out Jesus, they know that prayer is not going anywhere. Okay? So you'll have, you'll have public prayers all the time. They, they start off Congress with prayer. There's a chaplain comes out and leads Congress in prayer. And I almost guarantee you that it'd be an oddball thing if someone was invited to pray before Congress and actually use the name of Jesus. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm just saying 99 times out of 100, that guy's not going to say Jesus because he didn't want to offend the Muslims and the Wiccans and the pagans and the atheists and blah, blah, blah. Don't want to offend anybody. Don't want to offend the Jews, right? So let's leave Jesus out of it and let's just go to God. I don't, I don't believe in that. I think that prayer is in vain. Okay, I do. I think it's it. I think when you willfully leave Christ out of it, willingly and knowingly and willfully, I think God says, I don't hear you. I won't hear you. Okay? So, verse 25. Oh, well, we were in Exodus, right? I told you to go to Exodus. So, in Exodus 20. Verse 18, this is now God has spoken the words of the Ten Commandments. Verse 18, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. Four things they saw. 
And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. This is why, this is why in Hebrews he's telling us we're not come to that mount. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to run and hide from hearing the terrible voice of God. We can come to God boldly and not be afraid. Amen? Okay, it's just like you, if you had a good relationship with your parents, you could go and ask them things. You may not like the answer, but you could go and ask them. Okay, but back here in Exodus, they backed up. In verse 19, and they said unto Moses, speak thou with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. They were right there. That was God establishing the mediator as Moses. They were saying, Moses, tell God, don't do that anymore because we'll die. If he keeps speaking, we'll die for sure. We will die. God's, can you imagine that? God's voice being so powerful that it strikes terror into human hearts. God's big. Amen? God is huge. And His voice, we can't handle it. So they said, Moses, from now on, you go listen to God, come tell us what He said. But Moses then, when he goes to Mount Sinai, and he comes back, this is what I was getting at, J.R., Moses didn't just say, ooh, I heard God. Ooh, let me tell you what he said. Mm, some of you can write a check for $1,000. God said that to me just now. Okay, he didn't do that. He didn't come down with some story about what God told him. He didn't have a narrative that he spoke. Because what happens to work? Who remembers the exact words that I said three minutes ago? You weren't listening, were you? No, you were listening. But we can't do that. And if you were, you could probably go home and summarize everything I said in 40 minutes time in one minute. But it wouldn't be the exact words. So Moses, God does one better than just telling Moses what to say. He wrote it down. As for a memorial. What do we do when we want to remember a phone number? Write it down. Who's got grandma's recipes somewhere? Right? You got your mom's, you got Meemaw's cookbook? Okay? Written down. And she still makes Meemaw's cornbread stuffing. It's best in the world. Okay? But it's from what was written down. So it can be handed down and remembered from generation to generation. This is why God writes things down. He doesn't just say them, He writes them down. And anybody who will tell you that God spoke to them but cannot show you in the scriptures what He said, they're lying. And I don't care if they really are just on the off chance telling the truth, they're lying. They're lying. They may have heard a voice. I don't care. They're lying because it's not written in the volume of the book. And we don't have to listen to anybody tell us anything from God that's not already written here. Stand up and then I'll, I'll throw this in. Judge Judy. I learned this from Judge Judy. Not that Judge Judy. Although she was my judge, Philip. And jury. And executioner. And mortician. And yeah. Still am. <laughs> judge Judy says this. If you have a written contract with somebody. And then you say, well, after we moved in. 
the landlord said that we could have a dog even though it's not in the lease. Judge Judy says, absolutely not. An oral contract cannot alter a previously agreed to written contract. Can't do it. It's not upheld in court. Judges will not accept it. I don't care if you shook hands, cut each other's wrist, traded blood. Okay? I don't care if there was 50 people that heard it. If you have a written contract with somebody, an oral agreement after that written contract is null and void. So, at the end of our contract, God stipulated that no more words would be added and none would be taken away. Amen. And in this generation, we got to keep that. We better think that God was serious about that. Amen? Joe Smith's whole religion is null and void. <clears throat> Father in heaven, thank you for the contract. Thank you for writing it down. Lord, I love to remember scriptures, but I don't remember very many of them. And Lord, I can turn to scriptures better than I can remember scriptures. And I know one day, Lord, you're going to write every word in this book in my heart, and I won't need to carry this Bible anymore. But until then, you've given us your written record of everything that you said. We're bound by it, you're bound by it, and Father, we, uh, we love it. We don't have a problem with that. Father, help us to save some people who have been told that church tradition after the Scripture is more than Scripture, or who have been told that angel visitations trump the Scriptures, or that some new apostolic thing that where God spoke to somebody and told them this, that oil was coming out of a Bible. God... Help us, Father, to maybe reach somebody who fell for that and didn't know better. Because everything you want us to know is in this book, and we're confident of that. Help us, dear God, to carry this ministry. Father, you know where my heart is. Going into this week, Father, I'm not really looking to start a fight. I just know that the things I'm going to say is going to start a fight. But Lord, if there's one man in Turkana, or one man in Samburu, who will change their ways, because they were set free by the written word of God, then Lord, every sacrifice will be worth it. Father, bless this church in my absence. Lord, would you watch over them? Would you protect them? Would you bless them? Would you encourage them? Father, bless Brother Randy as he prepares and comes to us, Father. I love this man, and I thank you for him. God, use him mightily here in this place. Bring us back to the next appointed time, we pray in Jesus' name. And all, you know, all God's people said, I keep forgetting to pray. Amen. You're